Welcome back. Last time we talked about fat loss strategies, glycemic control, movement, and nutrition. And today we get to talk about something that ties it all together, the gut-brain axes. How exciting is this? Yes. This is going to be a good one. We are excited. Yeah, this is going to be a good we one. This is, this is your really cool topics, yeah. though. Yeah. You know, we always like chatting with you, Madison. Um, and I think to kick that you teed it off, the gut-brain sort of connection, from an evolutionary standpoint, think about like humans, you know, we've been talking about metabolism, fuel utilization, right, throughout this podcast series. So we need to eat, right? And so we have these mechanisms in our body that are like, you know, telling us to eat. We know when we have hunger, right? So you have appetite, we go around, we maybe thousands of years ago, our ancestors would forage for food, and then we would eat some food, and then we would be satiated. We'd like, no, we ate enough food, and we can rest and maybe go out hunting and foraging again. So these are all very an intricate set of mechanisms that the human body has evolved over, over thousands of millions of years, really. So these mechanisms haven't changed, but our, our modern day food supply has changed. So I think the first thing to understand is in our gut, when we eat food, it goes down a long tube. It's well over 25, 26 feet. And as it's moving, as the food's moving there, it communicates, it may sound kind of weird, but it's like there's a communication that's happening with the food and the lining of the gut. And that's why we call it the brain-gut connection because your gut then can talk to other areas such as your brain and say, hey, I'm full, stop eating. Or, hey, I'm still hungry or send some more. So if we, we kind of kick it off with that, just understanding that there is a connection, we think of the, the gut as the second brain, that's what it's being called. And I think we would move into how this affects metabolism. But John, I'm gonna start with that. What do you wanna add in on that? Well, I love the way you kind of set up this like communication and it's like, how do we know to stop eating, right? So I think intuitively you're like, oh, I feel full. There's a there's a physical mass of stuff in the stomach or something. So there's certainly like some physical senses of fullness, but there's also chemical senses of fullness. So over time, the body's devised ways to tell the brain, like you said, that I'm full. Like if we didn't have a means to shut off food, we would just eat indefinitely i know i would yeah, right we sure. just eat and eat and eat like what, what's the off mechanism but. so the body's come up with like basically a communication plan which is really what the endocrine and hormone system is it's a series of chemical messengers that basically tell the body to do certain things and so some of these hormones there's there's leptin there's ghrelin there's dppp4 and then there's glp1 and so all these things all these hormones like are a carefully orchestrated system to like carefully tune up, tune down and tell the body to do different things. So the one that's gotten all the attention lately is, is the GLP one yeah, for let's, sure. Let's talk more about that. Let's talk more about the GLP one because mm -hmm. a lot of people have questions about that. So just, we'd love to hear more about it. So. Yeah. Well, John kind of kicked it. Maybe I can tee it up and then you can, our, our resident biochemist can talk some more, but from a physiologic standpoint, as the food's traveling down your digestive tract it like we said it kind of communicates with the digestive tract and that's the beauty of like you know this this relationship that that we're describing but there's cells that line the the uh, the gut and we call them these these l cells that are very important in terms of uh on the the most like the most interior like layer of your digestive tract and when you, certain things can stimulate those cells to communicate and put out these digestive uh, these hormones and this is the hormone that, that John's alluding to, GLP-1, which is kind of trending in the media because it actually affects appetite. It goes back, like he said, a feedback loop, and it tells your brain that you're good. It tells your stomach. He, start, he talked about distension of the stomach. That happens when you, if I have a bunch of plant foods and, or you know, food, it'll just kind of fill up my stomach, and that distension will tell my brain, hey, you're good. But the hormone, GLP-1, will also tell my stomach, it'll slow down the gastric emptying, which can be a good thing because you don't need to keep piling food in your mouth, right? Um, and it also another important thing, it sort of controls sugar levels. It tells the insulin, hey, make sure you're, you're have that key ready to unlock the door to get the sugar out of the bloodstream and make sure we lower blood sugar and insulin levels. So it's got these interesting mechanisms. And I would start there, John, I don't know if you want to add on in terms of like what else it, it does from a metabolic function, like from a metabolic level. Well, I think that it's super interesting. Like you've just got all these fine tuned controls and it's the very act of eating food in a lot of ways that like tell these hormones to be released, right? So when you consume protein, that's like a signal to like release 
GLP-1, and that's going to create that feedback loop of fullness, right? So that's one of the reasons why protein has a satiating effect. And then the other thing you touched on an important point is these L cells. And so the, so the, the intestines, that's where, that's where GLP-1 is actually made. So if you have healthy intestines and healthy L cells, hopefully you have a, a reasonably good mechanism to produce GLP-1. We talked about previously was the metaflammation, all these cytokines, and these are constantly damaging the intestinal health and your microbiome. And if you're eating a lot of high sugar foods, that's also disrupting the microbiome in that you're basically populating the bad bacteria and you're getting an overgrowth of the, of the bad bacteria and an undergrowth of the good bacteria. That's like your intestinal health. So this is kind of the epicenter of like, this is why the food you eat impact your intestinal health, the gut microbiome, and this is how it's impacting GLP-1, which is impacting your brain and the foods you select. So like, hopefully you can kind of see this whole system playing out. It's really important. In some of the earlier episodes, Madison, that you were hosting, we talked about, you know, fiber is not just for like elimination. It's also for feeding the healthy gut cells, the microbiome in the GI say, tract. You would say that fiber is really amazing for Absolutely. GLP-1 support. It's the, very, so it's, he mentioned protein, and John, maybe you can walk us through the different categories, because I know you got protein, we got fiber, I think you also mentioned fats in an earlier episode, but um, what about like things in plants, these plant chemicals, botanicals, and uh, polyphenols and yeah. phytonutrients? <laughs> I know you like to. I love polyphenols, as you guys know. So you you know we talked about you know fiber is not just to keep you regular. It certainly has that function, and that's generally the soluble fiber, right? Um, but it's the insoluble fiber, and that's kind of like the other half of the equation. So, right, we said don't avoid plants and fruits because of sugar, but like those plants come with the fibers. They come with soluble fiber, and then the compounds. You mentioned the polyphenols. There's like 8,000 of these compounds that are like kind of been identified. And these are the compounds that give the plants their bright colors. Mm -hmm. it's, they often function as antioxidants in the body, but they also have a role of like feeding the gut microbiome. So the gut microbiome, like we need to eat carbs and protein and fats. Well, the microbiome, they want to eat soluble fibers and polyphenols. Mm -hmm. And so when your gut microbiome is happy, what they're they're sending out like, their, their waste product, this thing's called short chain fatty acids. That, is. that waste product is actually like healthy for the L cells in the intestine. When you have healthy L cells, we're back to making like normal protein levels. So, I mean, this is a really beautiful feedback loop of like why you need to eat plants, importance of plants, how it makes your microbiome, right? So it's, it's really a nice system. I often think about what John just described is like, think of the garden in your backyard and you know, when you're tending to the garden, you want certain flowers and plants to grow. Let's say you're growing tomatoes or whatever your favorite plant is. And then you want to keep the weeds at bay. You want to, you know, you know, prune and pluck the weeds out. It's really this delicate dance that the gut is doing when you're having the good stuff and you're making sure that it, and it naturally will kind of eliminate some of those things that you don't want to grow. So it's really kind of tending to the garden and that's what our gut naturally does. Mm -hmm.